Uh, but I do note that my curate has not turned up and she is preaching. So I've got all of my fingers crossed. Oh, she's it. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> you will not have impromptu preaching from me, which is good for all of us. Okay. So, a couple of. Ooh. How interesting. Okay, I'll just. That's not working. Definitely. <laughs> okay, so that's welcome it. everyone. Thank you for letting me know oh, that's much better. Isn't yes. It? Yes. So welcome on this Palm Sunday. I uh, have a few notices, uh, which is, firstly, thank you so much to everyone who came to the cleaning day yesterday. I think you will notice how sparkly St Andrews is looking this morning, and it's lovely as well to have um, the, the evil lectern back, and things that we've had to move for the building work, and also the work in the garden that's been done. That's wonderful, so thank you so much to everyone who came and cleaned. There is, at the back, a card, for Princess Alexandra, if you'd like to sign that, and also a card that's been sent to us from Barbara in New Zealand, and she wants that to get back so we can all read that and see her Easter greetings to us. Um, we have a quiz coming up soon, which will be lots of fun. Do you get your tickets for that? And also, on Tuesday next week, in Holy Week, there will be a wonderful concert here in the evening, and you can get tickets to that as well. Liz is already putting together her team for Ham Fair on June 8, so speak to her if you'd like to be part of that. And of course this evening is called Tenebrae, which is always a wonderful musical service that the extended choir put lots of work into to create a beautiful and thoughtful service to lead us into Holy Week. So uh, do come this evening if you're able to join us for that. One change that we are going to make in this service, which is one of the few things we haven't yet put back since before COVID, is that we're going to restart bringing up the elements in the service, which is part of our liturgy and also a great way for, for people to be involved uh, in the service. And so when we come to the offertory hymn, it's called that because that's when we offer things to God. We, um, do you remember we used to hand round the bag with the money, we don't do that anymore, but we used to offer our financial gifts and now we do that at the end with the card reader. But we also offered the bread and the wine to God, we brought up our offerings of the bread and the wine, the elements. And so we're going to bring that back and the people um, who have volunteered will bring that up just before communion, bring it to the altar, I'll say an extra little prayer that we always used to say. Um, and it's just that extra little element that we add back in that we haven't done for a couple of years. So just uh, to let you know that. Also, I'm swapping over the last two hymns, um, not just because I can, but because the children won't be back in time otherwise for the procession. And I thought that would be a shame. So um, they're right on the boards, but on here they're swapped over. And that means that when the children come in, we can all have our palm crosses blessed together you can join them and the choir processing round if you'd like to. And then afterwards, the children with Rachel are going to make an Easter garden at the back. And they're also, they've brought things from home like shells and stones and twigs. And they're all going to put their little treasures in and make an Easter garden. So that would be wonderful. So the final thing to say is just a message about our stewardship um, month, which is in May, uh, March now where we're thinking about what we love about St Andrews and what we can do together to support the church, to make it sustainable, keep it going into the future. And like we've had the last few weeks, two people have kindly volunteered to come up and talk about exactly that, what they love about St Andrews and why they want to support it. So I'm very grateful that Andrew and Mandy are going to come up. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, um, Caroline, my wife and I, first came to St Andrews almost 30 years ago, just before the birth of our first child. We'd just moved to Kingston, we were trying out various churches, and after a short while, without pressurising us, St Andrews welcomed us and felt like the right church for us. 
Now, of course, St Andrews is a lovely building and it sits in lovely surroundings, and that was certainly an attraction initially. And then over five years, we became very well acquainted with the Jolly Corner, a very great asset, and another ten years, been very well acquainted with Margaret and Sunday School, an even greater asset. But you don't just go to a church for 30 years on account of it being a nice spot and somewhere you can take the children. So I've sort of been thinking about what has kept me here, and this is just very personal, and concluded there are four things, and they all begin with the letter P. And I'm just going to mention them very briefly, it's not going to be a management lecture, but a very short paragraph on each one. The first one is preaching. Although I think preaching can sound a rather accusing word, what I mean is that the words uttered from that pulpit are important to me. They almost always make me think, or they challenge me, or they support me, and often all three in the same sermon. My second P is prayer. Words can be very helpful, of course, but the spaces between the words can be just as helpful. This is a church which allows me to hear the still, small voice of God, where the congregation are actively involved in leading intercessions, where Kay and Jeff Davis lead an extraordinary prayer newsletter, or where the Hand Priory group allows us to explore words and spaces between words drawn from different Christian traditions. My third P is people. We built friendships and relationships here. Some are strong friendships, some are just a friendly word every now and again, but both are important. And it's always felt to me that St Andrews accommodates people, both those with a resolute faith and those who might be slightly on the wobblier side, in which I often include myself. All are welcomed. My final P is participation. Across the course of the year, St Andrews invites participation without putting too much pressure on you, for which I am very grateful. If you fancy singing an extended choir, feel you could serve tea and coffee after the service, could be part of the welcome team once a month, organise a quiz night, etc, <laughs> etc, et uh, there are opportunities to get involved and meet other people. So what does this have to do with stewardship? Well, of course, I think our financial support is important, and there's no point pretending otherwise, in making this church a place where people can meet and find God for generations to come. But equally, all the money in the world will not sustain a church without preaching, prayer, people, and participation. So maybe a stewardship campaign is a time to reflect on all of those things too, and how we can contribute not just with our treasure, but with our time and our talent as well. Thank you. Now, Andy said, did I want to go first or second? And I said I didn't mind, but I made the wrong choice because it's very hard to follow that. <laughs> um, but anyway, why I love St Andrews? Um, I love St Andrews because children are so central to the mission of the church. As someone who adopted a little girl on my own with no family near me, it has been incredibly important to me to find communities for her, and the St Andrews community has been brilliant. I'm so grateful to everyone who runs the Sunday School, the youth group, activities for children at Sacred Space, to the people who organise the Nativity Play and Christmas Party, and also to Alice for thinking about how children can get involved in services such as the Darkness to Light service as Acolytes and also to all the people who have found roles for children in activities that aren't especially for them, like helping out at Ham Fair, the Christmas fundraiser, and the Easter quiz. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and I feel that St Andrews takes them by the hand and does lead them to Jesus. Thank you so much, Andy and Maddie, for those kind words. Um, and if I could encourage everyone to please take your um, your envelope from the back. If you don't find a named one, then there are blank ones there. But it just lets you know what the situation of the church is. And it just invites us all, if we are able, to come together to try and be part of, of making sure that our future is secure. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to the, the back of the church now and, and the choir will proceed in and we get ready to sing our first hymn.
We stand to sing our first hymn, which is number 485. Ride on, ride on in majesty, number 485. Do 
justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, he forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We remain seated as the choir lead us in the curious.
our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had <coughs> said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. A short prayer. Heavenly Father, may the written word and my spoken word lead us to the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. When my daughter, Jess, was younger, she liked to pick a role for herself when she was reading a book or watching a TV programme. Perhaps you've seen this with your own children or grandchildren or little people that you know. We would rarely turn a page of a book without her asking, which one shall I be? And the page wouldn't turn until she decided, I'll be the big bear. I'll be the one in the pink skirt. I'll be the smiling hippo. I quickly learned that the question, which one shall I be, was largely rhetorical, and I was not really needed to give an opinion. The choice was hers to make. I wonder if it's an important part of a child's development to imagine themselves within a story as a character. In the story we heard from Mark's Gospel this morning, there are a number of different figures. There is Jesus entering Jerusalem, riding on a colt. There are the two disciples who are sent ahead to fetch the donkey, which no one has ever ridden before. There is the larger group of 12 disciples who seem to be with Jesus throughout this episode. There are the crowds, the many people, who spread their cloaks and branches onto the ground, onto the road, and shout, Hosanna. And although they're not explicitly mentioned in this passage, we also acknowledge the presence of the Romans who ruled Jerusalem. So, a number of different persons within the action of this first Palm Sunday. And just like my daughter made sense of the story she heard by being a different character, I think that this story can be understood in different ways depending on who you are in it. First, Jesus. How does Jesus understand what's going on? Well, we see him, don't we, making deliberate choices. He tells two of the disciples to go on to a village ahead of them, 
where they will find a colt which has never been ridden. He tells them to untie it and bring it back to him. He somehow knows, I was struck by this when I read the passage, he knows that they will be questioned about their actions and he gives them the right words to say. The Lord needs it and, he, and will send it back here shortly. Jesus makes deliberate moves. Everything that he does has a purpose. And Jesus, I believe, acts in such a way that he is making a clear declaration about who he is. In Zechariah 9, 9, the scripture reads, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is the coming king the promised Messiah, which Israel should expect, Zechariah says. In their Gospels, Matthew and John explicitly quote this passage of Scripture to prove to their readers that Jesus is the Messiah, the coming King, who the Jews are expecting. Mark's version that we've heard today is more subtle. Mark doesn't tell us that Jesus is doing this as it is written or to fulfil what the scriptures have told us. Nevertheless, because of the very deliberate way Jesus is acting, it is clear to those who know and love the scriptures that he is fulfilling them. Secondly, we have the disciples. How do they understand what is happening? Well, Mark's particular retelling of this story, as is so often the case in Mark, is fast-paced and a little edgier than the other Gospels. We're never told by Mark exactly what's happening. There's a lot of action and there's no time to stand still. Perhaps the disciples, too, were left reeling after the entry into Jerusalem, wondering what on earth that was all about. They are obedient to Jesus as he asks them to go and fetch the donkey. They follow his instructions. They call Jesus the Lord as they are told to. Are they left wondering about the all-knowingness of their friend and master Jesus who gives them the right words at the right time for the right result? In Mark's Gospel, this is the first time that Jesus and his disciples go to Jerusalem. Once they arrive in the temple courts, Mark tells us that Jesus looks around at everything. And then, along with the disciples, he goes out to Bethany. It would have been clear to all the disciples that this wasn't just a way of Jesus getting into Jerusalem of getting from A to B. The purpose was in the arrival, in the procession, in the riding of the donkey, in the acclamations from the crowds. We also have the many people within this gospel story. There is a great crowd in Jerusalem. There are those who know and love Jesus, those who have heard about some of the great things that he's done, those who know that he's special in some way. The many people spread their cloaks on the road, spread that which they have cut in the fields. These people go on ahead of Jesus and shout, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How are the crowds understanding what is happening? We tend to see the crowds as quite fickle, one week cheering for Jesus as their king and their saviour, and the next shouting, crucify him, as they put him to death. But is the symbolism of Jesus' entry to Jerusalem clear to all in this crowd? Is it that some know and some don't know? Finally, we have the Romans, who must have been witnessing this procession seeing the crowds welcome this Jesus 
into Jerusalem. But this entry, this apparent fulfilment of prophecy, this declaration of Jesus as King of the Jews is not taken seriously. Why was it not quashed by the Romans? Why is it not mentioned in the trial narratives? Weren't the Romans worried? The Romans clearly didn't take it seriously as a statement of kingship. But those who <coughs> knew the texts know to take it seriously. So each party in this first Palm Sunday has a different perspective as to what is going on. Jesus, the disciples, the bystanders, those in the know in the crowd, the Romans. What about us? We're all at different stages in our journey of faith, and that's okay. You can be in the gospel somewhere. You can be drawn into the drama this Palm Sunday at the start of this Holy Week. You may be sure and confident of Jesus, who comes as a promised king, fulfilling all that is expected in a new and surprising way. You may be the disciples, willing to put your trust in Jesus' commands, knowing that you don't fully understand, but wanting to think more about who this person is. You may be part of the crowd, feeling a little bewildered of who Jesus is, and what this all means, but suspecting that there is something worthy of your time today. Whoever we are, and however we understand this, we can all have a part in the Gospel. When Mark writes about what the crowd uses to honour and lay before Jesus, he doesn't speak, as John's Gospel does, about large palms being waved. He doesn't even write about the crowd using branches, as Matthew does. He instead writes that the crowd uses spibadas, which is a Greek word, which literally means stuff from the fields. Being, and that's the stuff from the fields which is being laid before Jesus. We see those who come to honour and celebrate and give thanks for Jesus, bringing stuff from the fields, using what is there, using anything they can. You too can join in. You can be part of this gospel story. You can bring whatever you have to honour the King. The King who comes not in force, not in power, not in a way that is threatening to the ruling authorities, but in a gentle and humble way, this King presents himself to us, to those who understand and those who don't yet understand, but are intrigued. May we honour King Jesus today, however we can. I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Creed on page number seven. <coughs> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of the sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our intercessions. showing the strength and weakness, the power of service, and that love is forever stronger than death. You opened your arms for us on the cross. Open now our hearts so that we may run to you. Lord, in your mercy, may your church across the world stand in opposition to the values of greed and domination. May its leaders give wise guidance on global issues and ordinary Christians show kindness and warmth. May we all play our part in tackling the causes of climate change so that the earth that was created good can again be a source of abundance for all life. For when the earth is diminished, it is the poor and the weak who suffer first. Here in Ham, support Alice, James, Jen and Ursula as they lead our worship, <coughs> so it may help us reject the seduction of power and understand the topsy-turvy truth that it is the gentle and lowly of heart who can comfort others and find rest for their own souls. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray for peace in this world where there is so much war and conflict. We know that you, so often imagined enthroned in distant heaven, are walking with bare feet among those who suffer to give them courage and comfort. May we too recognise that, even if unable to solve the world's problems in their enormity, we can through small acts make all the difference in the world to the people we encounter. In this, may we be encouraged by those who, even in the most terrible <coughs> circumstances, perform tremendous acts of kindness and self-sacrifice. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we thank you, Lord, that we live in such a beautiful place, especially as spring returns, the hawthorn blossoms, and the birds sing with such mellifluous grace. But even here there are many who struggle with poverty, ill health, loneliness and loss. Help us to see when someone needs our help and give us the wisdom and courage to offer it in a way that it may be accepted. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray for all those who are suffering in mind, body or spirit. We think both of those whose names are listed on our pew sheet and those who are known to us personally. May they feel you near them. In your mercy, we pray for those who have died and for those the anniversary of whose death falls about this time.
their suffering is over and they are with you forever, where we hope to join them in our turn. Most merciful Lord, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please, would you stand? Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of this peace. number 1157 or glory lord and honor number 1157 <laughs>
have made, it will become for us the bread of life. We say together, blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Again, we say together, blessed be God forever. We turn to page number 22.
so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Andrew, St. Richard, St. Peter, and all the saints <coughs> may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, for honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We turn to page number 12 or page 7 in the Sunday School booklets. <coughs> As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant, and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you, and to proclaim you as Lord and King, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We say together on page number 16 or 10 in our Sunday School book this. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So if you all have your palm crosses, we're going to stand and hold them up now. And then in our final hymn, the choir will lead us in a procession around the church. And I invite everyone who would like to to join in with that. And then afterwards, the children are going to help us make the Easter garden. And you will find the words for that processional hymn um, separately in your viewing. It's on a white piece of paper. So let's hold up our palm crosses. God our Saviour, <clears throat> God our Saviour, whose Son Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these palms be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
And remember that there is also a lengthy group with discussions afterwards if you would like to join that. But we end now with our blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.